It's good to be in God's house tonight. Let's find our seats. We're going to begin our worship. Glad to be in the house of God. Uh, let's sing out that song. I was glad. And I was glad. I was glad when they said unto me, "Let us go into the house of the Lord." And I was glad. I was glad when they said unto me, "Let us go into the house of the Lord." I was glad. Yes, I was glad, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And I was glad, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We will worship, and we will worship in His presence. We will seek His holy face. We will celebrate His love in one accord. And we will join in adoration of the King of Righteousness in the house, in the house of the Lord. I was glad, I was glad, I was glad when they said,
the sun to the end of every day. Praise and honor all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. And who is like Him? Lion and the Lamb seated on the throne. Let's go. 
We want to lift up a number of needs as a church body. Uh, the uh, Maricopa Church, uh, pastor by uh, the Teelings, they're in revival tonight. Uh, the final service uh, with evangelist Artie Marin. We want to lift up that time that God would meet with them. It would be a fruitful uh, revival. Uh, believing God comfort uh, for the Vargas family, uh, the Cervantes family, both of these families and their loss, uh, uh, God's uh, grace and help 
uh, for them. Uh, numbers of folks that were touched uh, uh, in the memorial service yesterday, uh, not just here, but even right before service, a uh, testimony of someone in a, in a completely different state that uh, uh, was tuning in, uh, prayed a salvation prayer as a result of the uh, memorial, and so, amen, that believing God, that God would uh, uh, help there to be fruit and fruit that would remain from that. want to pray for... <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, Dave Gersten for God's healing in our brother's body. Uh, Cindy Link later also needing healing in her body. Little Mila Valine, we're believing God for a miracle. We're uh, just contending just with a fresh intensity for uh, the building that we're looking at, that God would give us direction, favor, open doors that no man can close, close doors that no man can open and give us uh, uh, insight and favor in that. Every new convert that's been saved, that God would strengthen and encourage uh, uh, these men and women. We're believing God for his spirit in our service tonight. The our nation, uh, we're in a desperate need of a visitation of God's uh, spirit that God would sweep across our land uh, and help us in revival. And we do want to pray for uh, Pastor Greg the, and uh, the uh, staff there in Prescott, the, their leadership uh, and all that they furnish. You're here tonight. You have a need on your heart. You just signify that uh, with an upraised hand. I want to encourage you. Uh, you would lift your voices together. Let's Ask God to move in our midst. Uh, when we're done, Joseph is going to come and uh, open our service in prayer. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father God. <coughs> God, we're asking you. God, that you would have right of way tonight. God, your spirit. God, your power. Uh, God, demonstrated. God, that you would have... Uh, Full access, God, to do all that you desire to do. God, in our midst, oh God, oh, be exalted, God. be lifted up. Father God, we come before you tonight, Lord. We usher in your presence tonight, Lord. We bring these praises, this glory unto you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We bring healing unto our bodies, unto our sisters, Lord God, our brothers, Lord. We ask you to anoint our pastor tonight, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I want to welcome you out. Our Sunday evening service here at the door uh, church in Tempe. And uh, we're glad to see you this evening. Believing God. God is going to move and touch hearts and lives. Uh, just a couple different uh, uh, announcements are the week ahead, the regular events, morning prayer, ladies' prayer, uh, of course, the midweek service uh, and uh, regular outreaches. Uh, uh, but then uh, looking ahead to next uh, uh, Sunday is uh, Easter Resurrection Sunday uh, and the thing that sets apart Christianity from every other uh, religion uh, system of beliefs is that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, Paul says, if he did not rise, of all people in the world, uh, we're the most uh, pitiable. But the truth is, he did rise. And so uh, we are victorious. Uh, and so uh, we're celebrating that uh, Sunday morning. We'll uh, partake in communion uh, after the morning service. And so I want to encourage you to be here for that. Uh, in the evening service, uh, we will be having the water baptism. If you've recently been saved, you're working with somebody uh, that's been recently saved and have not taken that next step, I want to encourage you uh, to do so. And then hard to believe uh, uh, we're racing through 2024, almost through March. April's right around the corner. And so uh, Saturday, April 6th, there's a youth rally in Prescott uh, uh, with uh, Pastor uh, Jesse Cluck uh, from Guam. And uh, that'll be a great time. And uh, amen. Uh, Pastor uh, Jesse has the mantle of his father, a Holy Ghost dimension. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's going to be a great time uh, of uh, ministry up there uh, for all the youth. Sign up list on the back for that. Uh, and then uh, April uh, 7th, wedding bells are ringing. Isaac and Michaela are tying the knot. And so we're going to look forward uh, to that. Uh, and uh, rejoice in that. Hallelujah. 
And so then just uh, uh, looking ahead, May 6th through 10th is our uh, Tempe conference. Uh, and I want to encourage you to be uh, keeping that in prayer. People from all over the world uh, uh, and all over the nation coming in. Always a great time. Uh, uh, but we need God. The Bible says if God doesn't build the house, the laborers uh, labor in vain. And so uh, encourage you to even now be, begin to be planning and praying for that uh, and that, that would be a fruitful time. Praise God. That's all that we have uh, uh, for announcements. Uh, and so we're going to have the offering at this time. Praise God. Uh, if I could ask uh, Sister Savannah, would you uh, like to share? She has a testimony of God's blessing. Go ahead, Sister. I think you have a microphone. Go ahead and, and share that. Um, I just wanted to give a quick praise report of what God's done in my finances. Um, so recently... Uh, throughout the Sunday schools, I felt really um, something that really spoke out to me that Pastor Olson had said was, um, if God can get money through you, then he can get money to you. So I just really felt challenged by God to up my world evangelism by three times the amount that I usually give. So I did that um, by faith. And just like as I was doing my budgets weekly, I just noticed ever since that I committed to doing that, um, that there's just been a supernatural like increase and it has no explanation as to why because the past two weeks I actually had had like cancellations with my job and like just it hasn't even been fully booked but yet there's just been such a supernatural outflow and I just only can connect it to the fact that God had challenged me and he is so faithful to do that. So I just want to give all the praise and um, glory to God. Ushers, would you kindly come and serve God's people? Uh, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, and he gives us something that is uh, uh, certain. It's, a, it's, not a, it's not a maybe. It's not like uh, this might possibly one in a million kind of a thing. Uh, it's, it's a uh, rock-solid promise from the Word of God, and it's found in 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So there's a very easy uh, concept. Uh, they were primarily an agrarian um, culture. You know, they understood about planting seeds in ground, uh, the process of growth and f coming, coming to the harvest. And it's obvious, you plant more seed, you're going to get more of a crop. So there's that factor. Uh, there's a factor that, uh, that according to the seed that you uh, will devote, the seed that you will commit, and Paul is taking that, he's taking that analogy from the uh, agrarian realm of, of agriculture and putting it into the realm of giving to God. So... I've said this so many times, uh, in, in large measure, you have the opportunity to write your own, kind of your own requisition form from God. You have the, um, when I worked for my dad in his factory, the manager on the, at the sheet metal department would give me a requisition form. I'd go up to the fourth floor inventory, present it to the uh, foreman up there, and the requisition form, because it was properly filled out and signed by the proper authorities, I would receive uh, what the, um, uh, the form was, you know, requisitioning. And so that's a, that's a principle. And then verse 8 says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. So grace, we think of a forgiveness of sin. We think of, uh, you know, maybe we pray this over our food. Uh, there's a dimension of grace on finances. There's a, there's a powerful, uh, supernatural uh, spirit, a spirit that moves in a miraculous fashion. God is able to make all grace, not some, not little dribs and drabs, abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. And so 
Uh, I encourage you to lay hold of God's promises in the realm of giving. Uh, God said, I delight in the prosperity of my people. The beautiful thing about God is you don't have to be a millionaire to start. You can be somebody that's basically on pennies, but you start to put God first, give God his portion, and you uh, learn to give and be liberal with God. You may have 10 cents, but <laughs> with a dime, you can start. And, uh, and then faithfulness, you'll see over a process of time. In, in the cycle of farming, there's a process of planting. There's a period of time. And then there's harvest. Let's bow our heads. Brother, uh, I'm going to ask Brother Mark Clark, if you'll ask the blessing, give and give Amen. God bless your giving. Not day long I've been with Jesus. It has been a wonderful day. I have climbed up one step higher in that good old gospel way. I have spoken words of kindness. Lord, you know if I've done wrong. So I go out and make it right so I can Thank you. Those on the platform appreciate uh, their labors. And if you have your Bibles, you could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It's our reading last week. If you're doing the uh, Bible reading calendar, uh, by way of opening, I've Use this, I believe, uh, it's been a well-used illustration, but bears uh, repeating the story of a young man who studied violin under a world-renowned master, and so eventually the time came for his first recital, and uh, by virtue of the crowd's response, this man was absolutely just... Uh, killing it. The, the cheers uh, it followed every uh, selection, but as people are watching him on stage, he seemed dissatisfied even after the final number. The shouts got louder uh, than ever uh, before, and yet this man just had this fixed look into the balcony until he found an old man uh, when he saw the old man in the balcony smile and give a nod of approval, uh, the, the young man finally just relaxed uh, and then beamed with happiness. Uh, you see, the man in the balcony was his teacher, and the applause of the crowd meant nothing to him uh, until he had won the approval uh, of his master. And so this uh, gives us some insight that this man recognized something. The applause of men doesn't matter if the master doesn't approve. But that also has another implication is that sometimes the crowds and, uh, and uh, others won't applaud or cheer on. But if the master gives his approval, it's still worth it. And so I want to preach a sermon in, that I've entitled The Curtain Call. And our text talks about the ultimate approval that awaits faithful 
Christians, and that is the Lord's approval. And two of the most common pictures that were given in Scripture and actually are kind of the backdrop of the theme of our upcoming conference are in connection to serving Jesus as a worker and as a soldier. And so in both of those, it's not uncommon because of the weariness of the work or perhaps even the wounds from the war to come to some incorrect assessments about our overall value and influence. But our text gives us some words of wisdom, and that is this, is don't get discouraged or distracted by the current level of recognition that you may have or may not have. Uh, don't make a final conclusion about the impact or the effectiveness uh, of your life. The reality is, is God uh, is going to weigh in. God has the full facts. And our ultimate validation and praise uh, will come from him. That's the hope. And so let's look at 1 Corinthians 4, and verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Paul says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged <clears throat> by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself. Yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will uh, both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts then each one's praise will come from God. Let's pray right here. Father, I'm asking you tonight, God, that you would have right of way in this service. God, give us a, an understanding of what these words mean. God, encourage the hearts of your people, God, and help us uh, to wholeheartedly give, us, uh, give ourselves uh, to the work that you've called us uh, uh, to, God. And we give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name and all God's people said. The curtain calls. So let's start with the calling. Because in our text, there are two words that carry importance. Uh, there's servant and steward. That word servant, uh, the King James, uh, perhaps uh, I believe renders it minister. The idea of servant or minister is actually an under rower. So this almost, uh, uh, this actually has a more uh, intense connotation of these would be slaves in the, in the, uh, in the, in the belly of the, of the ships that would be under rowing. They would be doing the hard work. It has the idea of a subordinate uh, or an attendant. Uh, perhaps even uh, we would think about a, a waiter that waits on somebody. And so doesn't matter what flavor that you give this word. The common denominator uh, is hard work, uh, many times unappreciated work, uh, unglamorous or lowly, and uh, delight of all delights, that's one of the things that uh, we're described uh, as. Uh, we are servants of God. And so that's not the full story, but that is part of the story, uh, is we're called to work. The other one is a steward. Uh, that is a manager or an agent. A steward uh, is a man or a woman that's entrusted to represent and manage or steward uh, someone else's assets. A steward is a representative uh, of somebody else. And so both of these words bring out different facets of being at someone else's disposal or under someone else's command. And both of these are so far removed from 2024 Christianity. Right? Think about some of these verses that give more light on what we're called to. First Chronicle, rather, First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. 
So you're not your own. Luke 17, 9 and 10, it's the parable of servants that are out working in the field and they come in when the masters arrived home and Jesus concludes this. He says, does the master thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, when you've done all those things which you've, you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Romans 12.1 gives yet another flavor. He says, I beseech you, brethren, uh, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies uh, a living sacrifice. So think about this collage that's being uh, presented throughout the word of God. Uh, is uh, We're servants, workers, stewards, uh, Hey, you have been bought at a price. You're not your own. We are unprofitable uh, servants. Uh, and yes, even a living sacrifice. Uh, and so in all of these things, uh, there's a faithfulness uh, requirement. The Bible gives us insight that different people are called uh, to different things. In a church this size, really a church any size, there's Different people, different personalities, different talents and abilities, and so different things that God entrusts uh, uh, to us. But the common thing across uh, the board is that uh, we're called to faithfulness. Paul, uh, in this uh, epistle, he says, uh, I planted, Apollos watered. Uh, we each had our part, but as we did our part, God brought the increase, Ephesians 4 and 16. It says, from whom the whole body joined and knit together, but by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And so here as individuals were described as being different parts of the body. And so with that said, your calling may be different from your neighbor's calling, and oftentimes it is. But again, the common denominator for all of us in verse two of our text is that we would be found faithful. And, and this, this changes the dynamics. Again, the context of that phrase is as a steward, that whatever talents abilities, opportunities that God has put in our hand, we're called to faithfully manage and to steward, not manage or steward what God's put in someone else's hands, but what God's placed in our hands. And the reality is that with that, we will give an account or put another way, we'll be called to judgment. Verse four, Paul says, he that judges me, is the Lord. That word judge has the idea of scrutinize. It's not just a snap judgment, but it's the idea is that the particulars, uh, the specifics are closely examined. There's an investigation, uh, an interrogation even. Uh, that idea of judging is that there's questions that are asked. Uh, there's an examination. Uh, and so uh, uh, we do serve a good God. Can you say Amen. But you have to hold these truths in balance is that this judgment is not a light thing. And actually, it should motivate us to give our best in whatever God has called us to do. That it's not just to pick or choose according to our whims. But the reality is it's an issue. God, I surrender to what you've called me to do. God, I will obey and I will submit to your calling. In another letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he's done, whether good or bad. And he goes on and he says, you know what? There's a terror involved in that. And again, you know, think about it. This is Paul the apostle. 
and all that he did uh, for God. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to be pleasing, yes, but there is a certain fear, uh, reverence, even terror. I would say that would be a good thing for us to uh, weave into our approach. So let's think secondly about the confusion. You know, there's a reasonable desire in life and even in serving God is that right, God, you know, this is normal people anyways, is that we want to be appreciated, right? We want our life to make a difference. It is a God-given normal desires that, you know what, I want to have a significance. That's wired into us from God. That is not wrong at all. The difficulty comes when we're comparing ourselves to others. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves uh, and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. <clears throat> you know, uh, it was mentioned this morning that it wasn't just Judas that did Jesus dirty. It was the other disciples that abandoned him. Peter that outright denied him three times. And how gracious is Jesus as he comes to Peter and works through the redemption of, do you love me, Peter? Yes, I love you, Lord. Do you love me? Three, right, three times for the three denials. And then Jesus, uh, you know, Jesus uh, then gives him a little insight. Listen, is uh, pretty headstrong, buddy. There's coming a time when uh, you're not going to like where you're uh, being led and where, you know, and, and he's giving him some insight about his end. And you would think, like Peter's just, I mean, it's a pretty major failure. And then God's uh, restored him, right? And yet so natural, and it's in all of us, is when he's getting the, the revelation of that, uh, you know, there, there's a price to uh, uh, following Jesus. He instantly, well, what, what about John? Right? That is wired in us. That's un you're, you're calling me to that, Lord? What about him? What about her? Right? So there's a, we, we get in trouble, is God has a custom course for each one of us. We're all saved uh, uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. I get that. That is a common denominator. But God has a customized course uh, for each and every one of us. And so not only comparing ourselves to others, but sometimes others comparing us to others. Perhaps this was happening. You look at the previous chapter. <coughs> Pardon me. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 and 22. Therefore, let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, and so then chapter one is not only is Paul compared to Apollos or Cephas, but there's even those in the Corinthian church, well, I'm of Christ. I'm, I'm more spiritual than, than all of you. And so uh, uh, this is a danger in the whole uh, coming to a proper judgment or assessment uh, of ourselves. Uh, further, there's the issue that, that there's clouding factors that muddy the water. You know, many times, and, and I don't know about you, but uh, it's often in, uh, in times of great breakthrough, favor, victory, or the valley of defeat and despair, we can look at our life and come to some wrong conclusions, whether extraordinarily good or extraordinarily bad, and that's dangerous, right? It's like trying to get a snapshot of, you know, a you know, moving, moving frame. And, you know, especially if you ever had one of those awkward uh, snapshots where someone gets a picture of you and you're, you know, you're, it's just not your right angle. Some of you don't like pictures, no angles are the right angle, but 
right? And so the, the issue is this, is that, uh, you know, that, that moment, it's not like everybody's memory of that moment is that awkward snapshot. That is just one snapshot in a moving stream of snapshots. And so many times uh, in the work and in the warfare is that we can look at a snapshot in time. And you know what? Uh, I am just such a failure. I haven't uh, uh, accomplished all that God has. Or you know what? I'm not going to, you know, man, the kingdom of God is lucky to have me. You know, both of those are incorrect assessments. Another thing is that we ha- there's the perspective factor. We don't have uh, all of the facts. There's bias at work uh, in every one of our lives for and against. There's the fact that, uh, amen, we, because of those things, we can, we can be deceived. And so those things cloud uh, our assessment, Paul uh, is, is uh, wrestling, this and, and wrestling with this. And he even says, he goes, I don't even judge myself. See, there's a difficulty with motives. Look at verse five. <clears throat> five. It says, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts, then each one's praise will come from God. So he talks about the hidden things of darkness and then links that with the counsels of, a, of the heart. In other words, the motives. And so two things here to bring out is number one, don't try to diagnose others. Right? Many times we're the, we're the expert. I know why they're doing what they're doing. Actually, you don't. You can render a, a guess, but yeah, you don't have all the facts. They're just trying to impress a uh, pastor. They're just trying to impress others. Uh, you know what? That's not entirely pure motives, which let's be real. That's, there's not one of us that has entirely pure motives. If, 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 <laughs> if that's all God had to work with, there's no one that qualifies Right. But you know what? Hey, is there are these sinful uh, people that are redeemed by God, that God is moving on and working on? Are they a work in progress, just like we're a work in progress? Yes. Amen. Are there some issues, uh, some things that they're working through? Yes. Just like we are. And so uh, uh, again, so it's uh, we don't uh, we don't. uh, uh, That's not our calling. Number two is that examine our own motives uh, with sincerity and humility. David uh, has this tact in Psalms 139, 23 and 24. He says, search me, O God, know my heart, try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is a very healthy thing is God. Uh, I may not uh, and, uh, uh, and don't have, I'm, I'm not the purest of the pure, but I'm doing the best that I can, God, with what you've given me. Yeah. But God, even in that, I need you to help me, God, uh, point out things uh, that you want to move upon and change. But you know what? The truth is even here in dealing with yourself, uh, you have to be careful. Because there's great difficulty, uh, uh, you know, when it, it comes to this word judgment. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, we, people judge not lest you be judged. Uh, I, I believe that's not talking about coming to some conclusions. I believe that's the final judgments. In other words, uh, there's not one of us uh, that has the final word on whether someone makes uh, heaven or hell. That is God's judgment to make. But that doesn't mean we don't render judgment. In fact, Jesus, the same Jesus that said those words, again, in the context of someone making heaven or hell, says judge with righteous judgment. And so I believe if you take uh, all the verses uh, together in balance, a healthy self-examination is good 
and necessary, but even there, we still don't hold all the facts, uh, or all the cards, rather, or have uh, all the facts. Our text, verse 3, he said, In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, uh, but he who judges me is the Lord. And again, what, what Paul is getting at is not that he's not making some judgments along the way, right? He's talking about uh, in, in different places where he does make judgments is I don't want to be disqualified. I want to run uh, according to the rules. Uh, but what he's talking about for himself and for us is, listen, uh, even the final judgment, I don't know how that's going to go. I have to leave that in the hands of God. So let's look then at the commendation or the curtain call of heaven. You know, the truth is the praise and the criticism of men and society is fading. You think about the backdrop of Jesus, right? So in that day, the most powerful man in the world uh, would have been Caesar, closer to home. He stands before Pilate, who's the ruler over the local area. You know, the empire hailed Caesar as Lord. Uh, people kowtowed to Pilate and curried his favor. But you know what? 2,000 years later, is uh, uh, we know about those figures, not on the basis of who they are, but in connection to Jesus. You know, think about even closer to home, the superstars and the celebrities of 50 years ago. I get it. There's a few outliers, uh, Elvis, and whether he's dead or not, uh, uh, you know, there, there may be a few outliers, but largely the superstars and the celebrities uh, from just 50 years ago, they're largely forgotten. But think about it as we're coming into the Easter uh, and uh, Resurrection Sunday, our Savior that was betrayed, uh, that was rejected, uh, and that was crucified is that uh, he uh, rose again from the, the grave. Even Philippians 2, 9 says, God has also uh, highly exalted him and given him the name uh, which is above uh, every name. Acts 5, uh, 30 and 31 says, the God of our fathers uh, raised up Jesus, uh, whom you murdered uh, by hanging on a tree. Uh, him God has exalted uh, to his right hand to be prince and savior uh, and uh, to give repentance to Israel uh, and forgiveness uh, of sins. And so what man or women give as far as recognition, admiration, uh, uh, encouragement, uh, or even the world, uh, that is fading. But it, this points then to the ultimate recognition. In our text, uh, it says, uh, uh, verse 5, then each one's praise uh, will come from God. Uh, that word praise means applause. And that's where I got the uh, the, the title, the curtain call, is that it's after a production where the, uh, a lot of times in a theater is the, the cast will come out and the crowd will rise and give them uh, a, uh, a standing ovation. It's the curtain call. Uh, you know what uh, is if we faithfully serve our Lord and Savior, uh, amen, as stewards, uh, as servants, uh, what we have to look forward to uh, uh, is uh, Luke 19, 17, that he said to him, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over 10 cities. Uh, again, uh, what God has called you to may be different than what God has called somebody else to, uh, but the encouragement that we can take uh, is that if we will run our race uh, with a faithfulness uh, through the high times, through the low times, uh, keeping our heart right, uh, keeping uh, uh, a perspective that you know what, I'm doing this unto Jesus, uh, amen, is that we can hear those words, well done, uh, good and faithful servant. That'll mean far more than what anybody can say here on earth. You know, Stephen is, uh, you know, an encouragement has been asked. So who is more of a success? Is uh, Peter who st stands up and preaches and, and uh, uh, 
uh, you know, 5,000 people or 3,000 people uh, uh, get saved on that day of Pentecost uh, or Stephen who gets up and preaches and has a love offering uh, of 3,000 stones? That's a trick question because they're both successful in their own, their own lane. It was at Stephen's sermon that the seeds of the gospel were planted in Saul who was later to become Paul. But the point is, is that if you took the snapshot in the moment of time of a corpse uh, that is laying there, uh, is it would be very be easy to possibly come to the uh, conclusion, man, uh, uh, why did it have to end that way? Why didn't God intervene? Uh, I, you know, boy, that was a failed uh, outreach. And yet we see moments before his death, uh, Acts 7, 55 and 56, uh, but he he, speaking of Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You know, that is incredibly encouraging, but uh, and, and even more so when you uh, realize that after his resurrection, Jesus is you usually referred to as sitting at the right hand of God. Uh, and yet when there's a faithful uh, martyr, in other words, a faithful witness, uh, you could say a faithful worker that is doing what he is called to do in service uh, to Jesus Christ, his king, the world uh, looks down. In fact, in that case, the world uh, literally uh, kills him for that witness, uh, but his Savior, the same Savior that we serve, uh, as he is being uh, uh, ready to enter into heaven, he, it's like he's, uh, he's standing. Uh, I see Jesus standing at the right hand uh, of the Father, uh, not even content uh, to sit, but standing. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, man, it gives great encouragement, uh, is here's the ultimate recognition. Bible gives us insight. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Matthew 19, 29 and 30. Jesus gives this encouragement and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife, children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Many who are first will be last and the last first Again, I don't, you know, we, we don't know all that that means, but what it, one of the things that it does mean is that God has a different valuation system than we do. And hear me out. We're coming up to a conference, and we rightly celebrate those that have gone to regions beyond, whether that's here in the United States, whether that's overseas. And we rightly commend and, and appreciate these that have gone. But one of the things uh, that, I'm trying to think of how to verbalize this. I guess one of the things that pains me is when at conference time, when the very people that make it possible to go, that are the rope holders, that are faithful in their giving, Prayers, uh, staying by the stuff in the good times and in the bad times. You have no idea. Uh, people come back to conference. Yes, they're encouraged by the keynote speakers, the Pastor Lambs, the Pastor Campbells, the Pastor Greg. But you know what? Many times what encourages them just as much, wow, there are the faithful people of God still in their place. Wow, there's John and Sarah Teeling still serving God after all these years. Wow, there is Steve Pierce still uh, playing the keyboard, uh, faithful at his post all these years. Wow, 
There is KK and Cheryl uh, welcoming us uh, at the uh, registration desk. And I could go on and on and on. Uh, and yet the psych job of hell many times is, well, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not out there. I'm not a celebrity. Or, or m- m- maybe even I, I went and come back. And the, 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 it, it, it is a propaganda job uh, from hell that somehow we're not as valuable or valid. But Jesus says the first will be last. In other words, if we're faithful in our lane that God has called us to, I have no doubt in heaven, there, we're, we're going to be in for some surprises. And that God is, again, because he has all the facts. He knows all the dynamics. And that the ultimate recognition comes from our Lord and Savior. And so this brings us then to the challenge to wholeheartedness. Is that whatever we're called to or for others, whatever season we're in in our, maybe the calling that God has for us, it it differs season by season. But whatever it is, is God, I want to be found faithful with what you've entrusted me to. God, if I'm maybe the most unglamorous job in the, in the church, but God, I'm going to be the best at that job. God, I, you know, maybe I, I can't sing. When I sing, people leave the county. <laughs> but I can pray. So God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. God, I'm going to be at my post. I want to be... Found faithful, you know, the, whether it's the bumper sticker or the tattoo, only God can judge me. What a cop out, right? But you know what? Like many things, there is some truth to that. And again, not the, with the attitude, you know, uh, that, that, that it's put on a car or put on skin with. Only God can judge me. But the truth is, God is the only one that can truly judge. And it, so it shouldn't be a cop out. Like, what are you looking at, man? What, only God can judge me. No, the issue is people are looking at me. Hopefully they're seeing Christ. And you know what? That actually is a motivation that as they're looking, they're, and I can't, I can't work out all the judgments that they come to, but I can do the best that I'm at least stacking the deck that they're going to come to the right judgment. But whether it's others, whether it's myself, uh, is that, you know what, uh, I'm going to use the fact that only God can judge me to give my very best. Uh, God, whatever you've called me to do, uh, whether again, in this particular season or ultimately in a lifetime, uh, I'm going to give it my best. Uh, and God, I'm keeping perspective. Sometimes, man, we're thinking we're just killing it, man. Uh, we're just doing so awesome uh, for God. And, and maybe we're not as much as, of a success uh, as we think we are. And there's other times uh, where we look at what we've uh, done and have or seemingly haven't uh, accomplished. And we come to some incorrect uh, assumptions. Uh, man, it was a, uh, uh, that was a failure. I'm not making impact, but we keep perspective. God, as I will be faithful, God is, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm going to keep the perspective that in the final uh, analysis, uh, you know everything uh, that uh, I'm dealing with, God, uh, and you're going to make uh, uh, the right uh, uh, judgment, uh, and there, there will be the ultimate recognition. And again, ultimately, it's a trust issue. I close with this. According to the United Press International, as the Vietnam War was nearing its end, a nightmare began for the family of Private First Class Alan Barton. Barton was killed by a landmine just outside his base in Vietnam. The army was unable to identify the remains Meanwhile, Barton was unaccounted for, and somehow the officers in charge didn't see the relationship uh, between these two events. In other words, the landmine going out and 
and, 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 uh, and him not being there. And so because of that, the army classified uh, Barton as a deserter. The family, of course, was devastated. Having your son labeled uh, a deserter is a shame for any parent, uh, but much more for this family. Barton's father was a 20-year army veteran. His mother didn't believe that her son had deserted. She insisted on his innocence for 13 years. Uh, her son's unidentified remains uh, lay in a military morgue in Hawaii, <coughs> pardon me, as she fought to clear his name. Finally, the army rechecked uh, the morgue records, and this time uh, they correctly identified Alan Barton's remains. So check this out. This is uh, 13 years uh, later. In February 1983, the army honored the soldier it had wronged. They gave Alan K. Barton a full military funeral. Soldiers sounded a salute, and a, uh, a bugler played taps. Barton's mother wept into a tightly folded U.S. flag that moments before had draped her son's uh, silver coffin. The point uh, of this is that in this world, uh, even heroes at times uh, can be wrongfully uh, incriminated, incriminated rather. Uh, but just as this soldier's name was cleared and honored, uh, so does our God uh, promise to vindicate his servants uh, that are found faithful. Uh, and whether it's in this world or in the final judgment, the truth will come out. And the heavenly uh, 21 gun salute will be given. Uh, the bugle will sound. Uh, the flag, or maybe in our case, the crown uh, will be presented. Uh, our name will be vindicated. Let's bow our heads all over this place. Amen. The curtain call. You know, before we go on any further, first and foremost is you're here this evening and you're not saved. You're not right with God. Again, I've, I've talked about the final judgment in connection with how we've lived for God and the success of that ultimately only God knows. But the Bible lets us know that as far as our relationship with God, our conscience bears witness whether we're right with God or not. And the dividing line is sinners are those who have not turned to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, whether looking to religion, their own works, whatever else is... Uh, They've refused to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Christians or those who are born again are not just you know, people that have reformed themselves. Simply put, they're people that have chosen to come to Jesus on his terms. The Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you're here this evening and you're not right with God, can I encourage you, you're in the right place that God loves you. That love was shown in sending Jesus Christ to Calvary's cross in my place and in your place. And the love of God is actually what held Jesus on that cross. It wasn't the nails that held him on the cross. He could have removed himself from that cross. It was the love of God for me and for you, lost sinners, those who had fallen short of the glory of God. And the good news is tonight, you could be the worst sinner in the world, and yet if you'll turn to Jesus, he can have mercy on you. And you're here, you'd say, that's exactly what I need. I need God's mercy and grace. I'll be honest, I'm away from God. I'm in living a life in rebellion to God. But I, re I wanna receive that mercy and that forgiveness. Here's my hand. Very quickly, you'd raise it, hold it up high. Say, that's me, Pastor. I need Jesus Christ. I'm ready. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of fighting God. Why would you want to fight God? That's the worst fight in the world. He's the one who loves you more than anyone else. He could have mercy on you, set you free from your sin, give you a new start. You'd quickly raise your hand. Say, that's me. God's dealing with me. And I don't want another day to go by to be on the run from God. Or maybe you're a backslider. 
Tonight's the night to come home, backslider. You'd quickly raise your hand. Life is short. It's passing. You only have one lifetime to make it right with God. And you'd just quickly respond if you're feeling God pull on your heart. That's the goodness of God that leads men and women to repentance. Sinner or backslider, one last appeal. You just raise your hand, hold it up high where I can see. Be our honor to pray with you. Hallelujah. Then turning the order of the service, I preached on the, the curtain call or the applause of heaven. And hopefully the encouragement is that, you know what? Uh, this passage uh, should bring some perspective uh, for us. It ought to stir us uh, to serve God, not out of fear, but out of an encouragement. Uh, you know, we serve a God. He holds all the cards. Uh, he is faithful, uh, and that ought to stir our faithfulness. Uh, and that you know what? Thank God it's not wrong to have some rewards or commendation. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> this side of heaven. But you know what? Our ultimate our ultimate reward is in heaven to come. And if we can keep that perspective, even if we are wronged, or even if we are uh, perhaps, and it's not known, the sacrifices that, that were made, can I tell you the same Jesus that stood to commend Stephen for his faithfulness? Uh, I don't believe that's a once-off. I believe that there, there's gonna be some other moments where our Lord uh, stands to welcome and salute the heroes of the kingdom, uh, the regular and faithful uh, men and women uh, that have stood by the stuff uh, through the years. Let's stand. These are all Altars uh, are open. Hallelujah. Yes. I can't wait to hear the words well done. Faithful servant, well done, enter in, well done, this is heaven. Hallelujah. I will wait on you, Lord, till you come. I can almost hear the trumpet sound. Hallelujah. In a twinkling of an eye, I'll be gone. I can't wait to hear the words. Well, well done. done. Well, well done.
Why don't we give God praise tonight? Hallelujah. Amen. I, I actually wasn't thinking of this sermon in context of the upcoming conference, but again, interesting is the worker and the and the warrior, both of these, the weariness at times, the wounds can cause us to come to incorrect assessments about our value and our influence. And I just want to say, and I, I didn't compare uh, notes or, you know, talk to my dad about what I was preaching, but I have absolute confidence that I'm too, to just say to the Tempe Church, the faithful saints, amen, how much we appreciate you guys, your faithfulness, day in, day out, week in, week out. And to just encourage you, uh, again, and we, this is not to take away from uh, the workers on the field. That is not my point. But I think sometimes we come to some incorrect assessments. Man, they're the MVPs or, you know, we're just little old us. But they, they couldn't do it without you guys. And just I, I pray that God would just encourage you that, you know what, uh, he, he has a whole different value system and uh, and uh, just to know uh, amen again uh, my wife and I my my dad and and mom I was so grateful for the the, the faithful saints of God uh, that are uh, at their post in their place we are able not only to touch Tempe but touch the world because of people uh, uh, that uh, fill this uh, room that you may never give a conference report. Your name may never be in the bright lights. Hopefully I do my best uh, uh, and I hope others do as well to appreciate and commend. But you know what? Even if all those things evade you, there's coming a day, amen, where the one who has all the facts, knows every sacrifice, every act of service is able to say, just like we were saying, well done, good and faithful servant. And so, amen. We're going to be dismissed, uh, encourage you, you uh, be a blessing to someone before you leave, but hopefully keep these words uh, uh, and uh, encourage yourself. Uh, uh, amen. Uh, uh, God is a God is a good God, and he is, he's gonna, uh, he is going to reward. And, and even uh, some of the chapters that we looked at is, man, that was a, that was a failure. I, just, I, I didn't make impact. That, I think heaven's, part of heaven is going to be, let me show you the rest of the story. And so, amen. Let's be dismissed. Let's stand together. And as we uh, go uh, from this place, uh, amen. If I could uh, have uh, uh, Brother Nick Rice just lift his voice, close us in prayer as we go. Father, tonight we're grateful to be in the house of God. We need more of you and less of us. God, thank you for the words that I just said. Preach God's love and joy. We take that word this week, God, and honor your name, God, that you be glorified in our lives and our testimonies, God. We share, God, what you've done in our life, God, to the unsaved. Yes. God, Amen. God bless you and you be a blessing to someone as you leave.